two concrete spans there. That was picked up by the storm surge and deposited back between the bridge, the bridge concrete. And then on the outside, there was another very similar tugboat. That he's on the landward side. He's in the marsh. The storm surge picked it up and took it over and dropped it on the back side of the bridge. I saw more examples of this kind of stuff than you could shake a stick at. This is what I call car soup here, car and, and, and two-by-four soup. It looked like this way too many places where I went. Um, the first thing that happens after you have a storm clear is the Army Corps of Engineers goes in with big earth moving equipment and they use GPS and they follow the road and they literally bulldoze the stuff out of the way. Okay. Um, a lot of other things that happened was they found all kinds of ships and boats inland, me in some cases, several miles inland from the shore. That is a barge upside down in this guy's ne in this neighborhood, stuff like that everywhere. Um, being a power plant engineer, this is a picture of the, the 20 foot tall levee outside of Maku power plant. And there's a dotted line across there. That's the top of the levee. And you can see the storm surge is rolling over the top of that 20 foot levee. And picture was taken from the plant manager's office window. Um, that picture was in Power Magazine in 2006. And I actually bothered to get permission from the publisher to use it. I'm lost now. <laughs> My temper. I've been lost for years. I'm used to it. Good. Okay. Um, we'll get there in a second, folks. Um, the main county road coming in from Waveland into Kill, Mississippi is U.S. is uh, State 603. If you look at the overpass there, see where the black arrow is, there is a line of debris settled on the overpass 14 feet above the road level. I got out with a tape measure and measured it. Um, that's five and a half miles inland from the coast. The water there was 14 feet high before it before it flowed back out and it left the, uh, the trash line like a bathtub ring, if you will. No, it's going out. Jack, can you hear us? Can anyone else? Okay, okay, thank you, Jack. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so that kind of gives you an idea. If we had had a storm like that land here on the, the, the east coast of Jacksonville, FCCJ South Campus, FSCJ South Campus would have been underwater. The top, the second floor would have been underwater. Um, this presentation was originally made to my management at JEA trying to get some appreciation for what we were in for if we ever had a storm like that hit here because we in Jacksonville have this misconception that nothing's going to land here and nothing's ever going to cause us grief like this. So I'm one of those people that tries to not let them forget it. If you look at the map of southern Mississippi here, you see the red circle, that's US 603 and I-10. You can see that's a long ways from the coast to have 14 feet of water. The entire, the, all of the blue on this map basically is flooding several foot or more. And that's the, that's just a huge amount of flooding there. There was just, everything was devastated out there. Army Corps of Engineers came in and they basically push a road back where the road used to be. And then they come in with, with dumpster trucks and load it up with excavators and, and haul it off. Everywhere we went, there was cars, cars that had been picked up and, and moved and, and redeposited places they didn't belong. And that created a huge market for used cars with Katrina flood car victims. I know I bought a Mercedes SL and, and it's sitting in my backyard and it's got rust in places you can't have rust in. Um, just pictures of, of the, the huge amount of, of debris that had to be dealt with. So I spent 10 days at the Emergency Operations Center, and my buddy Bill Brogan that came out with me, he, he was uh, rotating between satellite locations. Um, 
<clears throat> one of the things that was most notable by two weeks after the storm was that that salt water killed dadgum near everything in, in Mississippi. I mean, you can look at the branches or the, the leaves on those trees, they're brown. It's from salt water. Uh, waste management people, they had people from all over the country, contractors coming in to haul stuff out. You're talking 35 to 50 million cubic yards of debris, which is basically a football field two to three miles high. I mean, it's a huge amount of trash. There was wild animals running around all over the place. This is a rural area that farms and people's, the people's uh, livestock that survived were just running amok. Uh, CSX East West Main Line was demolished. Basically, um, they, uh, Amtrak no longer runs a train through there because CSX abandoned the rail line. There was so much washout that it was just not feasible to, to repair the line. Everything along the coast was stripped to the foundation. Everywhere you went, there was nothing but concrete slab and any place where there was reinforcement sticking up except for the Latter-day Saints Church. Look at this picture. There's not even shingles off of the roof. There's grass in the front yard. I took that picture. I know that did not come off the internet. Anyhow, the Corps of Engineers worked with the government agencies to provide ice and water and you know, temporary roofing, basically blue, blue tarps, temporary housing, power assessments, debris removal. They, had a, they, they, they do a big, big job. The National Guard had a huge presence out there. They had uh, another uh, uh, mutual aid agreement with the Ohio National Guard, so those people were out there. They were providing law enforcement and, and, and guard service, if you will. Just because there's no lights and no water doesn't mean that there's not crime and problems. Okay? And I, I, I ran the uh, net control and the dispatch trailer for about four days, and we covered, I took, I, I, with one line, one radio call per line, legal pad, 100 pages of legal pad. That's how many contacts that I passed. And we made a decision on and decided who to call and pass the information through. We were busy. Um, Bill Brogan and I traveled from Florida. They tend to send you in pairs and keep you together, or at least fairly closely. Um, the reason for that is the buddy system is always a good idea. When you get it out in a place like that, you're carrying fuel and food, and then some people carry firearms, radio equipment, the whole nine yards, and there are people out there who are very, very well willing to take it from you. Uh, when I showed up, there was already 15 other hams sitting in the EOC conference room, and uh, we, we got uh, a big... Uh, dissertation from Randy Pierce, who was uh, the ESF2, the communications guy. Um, the International Airport, Stennis International Airport, right across from the EOC building, which is the local high school, they had helicopters and cargo planes in and out 24-7. Everybody that was there that had any business there, and they basically exclude people that don't have any business there. You're badged. Even the, the, the body sniffing dog had an ID badge. And the purpose for that was so that somebody didn't take him as a pet, you know, oh, poor puppy needs a home, <laughs> and take, take one of the working dogs. Um, the other thing is, is there's a curfew. You'd better follow it because the people out there that are milling around in the middle of the night are carrying M16s and they are full of live ammunition, as I'll show a picture to you. But anyhow, once we, once we got out to Akil, Mississippi, we got this briefing. Don't drink or wash with the potable water anywhere. There was a, a, a problem with, with uh, hepatitis was starting to pop up. They were very concerned about that. So they made us wash our hands with, with disinfectant. Every time we thought about it, it's definitely before you smoke or eat. If you're driving a vehicle, every intersection is considered a four-way stop because there was no signals. And they said that most people would be able to deal with being in this situation for 96 hours before they wanted to swap you out with somebody else. I ended up being there 10 days. Um, National Guard, 
every county in the state of Florida sent an EOC representative and people and trailers, radio trailers. There were so many radios out there that we had communications interference problems. National Guard had a nice rig set up. You see the 55 gallon drum there? That's a weapons clearing drum. It's full of, it's full of sandbags. And basically you'd see a guy walk over there, drop the magazine, click before they were allowed to go into the, into the uh, National Guard area. The guys were carrying live ammunition and real guns. They were not playing around. Anyhow, they had all kinds of cool trailers uh, with microwave connections. They had the only cell phone coverage of any flavor for probably a 75 mile radius. You know, there was <laughs> every converted bus full of radios out of the state of Florida was there. They brought in edicts systems, emergency deployable interoperable communication systems, basically allow all the different people to talk, to be interoperable on their different radio systems. And that means trunken radio, non-trunken radio, ham radio, you name it, they could talk on it. Everywhere you look, there was a, a communications van. Motorola. Motorola showed up. The first thing that Motorola did was in every affected county, they put up a brand new Motorola repeater and tower and emergency gen set. And then they got busy on trying to install um, trunk and radio systems in the new cars that were arriving from dealerships from all over the country. Um, <clears throat> ham radio operators were, were uh, thick at the emergency operations center. Everybody tried to set up dipoles and verticals. Um, did a lot. The hams were the the, the uh, police fire rescue dispatch on the night on the day shift for probably 21 days. Basically, the people that that lived in Killa, Mississippi, that worked for the 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 sheriff's office and the fire department, they were mostly run out by the flood. They had no place to stay, so that's why they send in people from other states. The first thing that I asked me to do was to program 10 Yaesu two meter rigs because they didn't have enough ham radio operators. We had 15 per shift and that wasn't nearly enough. So the state of Florida got the forestry service, the Florida forestry service to send over trucks and able-bodied men and I was told to program these radios and teach them how to run their own net. Okay. Um, I believe it was Randy Pierce was the, the uh, NIMS communications coordinator. He, in my presence, he called up the FCC using the cell phone link and basically told them what he was planning on doing. We're going to use unlicensed people on ham radio to provide additional communications. We will train them. And then he's told, no, cease and desist. And Randy told them, I'm in church. But it was a negatory Big Ben. So by the time I left, there was radios installed with cigarette lighter plugs and mag mounts on the roof. And they had 10 additional people out there helping to communicate. Worked out pretty well. That really stirred up uh, a lot of administrative unhappiness and I'm not even sure what happened at the end of that. John, did you did you ever hear anything further about that? Well we could have a conversation about <laughs> <laughs> Yes. But anyhow, they were not happy. But the radios were there and they got used. Anyhow, <clears throat> then I got to run the net control position for for uh, I guess it was four or five days. There was like 20, it was like a wheel with 25 different spokes. Okay, there's a lot of people in a lot of places in Hancock County and, and also there was a like operation center in each of the other state in the other counties. And we communicated from EOC to EOC and past traffic that way. Um, inside the county, basically, we had, I said, what, about 12 or 13 Red Cross locations and we provided communications for them as well as they had their own um, uh, low band VHF radios. Um, 
the we were basically the only communications official communications out there for 17 days after the landfall accidents fires mental health problems coroner calls looting missing people down power lines domestic and non-domestic animal problems gunshots you, you name it the same stuff that goes on in your in your little town before the storm happens after the storm and somebody's got to deal with it logistical stuff we had to deal with dumpsters kitchen supplies blue roofs tarps t tents and cots and equipment repairs for for every piece of equipment that was out there Just think about how many forklifts there are in all those places unloading tractor trailers full of water and food information medical supply list which is what's driven me to want to be able to do um, email over hf radio i don't ever want to have to describe to transcribe pharmaceuticals vertical verbally over a radio again that was not fun that's one of those places where everything has to be fanatic and and you can't afford to have one single mistake because you'll kill somebody um anyhow so there's dozens of logistics details that happened at every pod which which uh, basically was where they had tractor trailers giving out water and ice and food and that type of stuff. Um, <clears throat> National Guard from Ohio was, was running a lot of the uh, point of delivery pods. Um, tremendous amount of talking back and forth on the radio. I've, I, I've never since seen so much official business type work, if you will, go over on, on the ham radio. So I had a, came to a few conclusions after having been out in the field a few times. As far as equipment and hardware and provisions go, more effective radiated power is better. I do not ever want to be caught someplace where I could not communicate with home again. The, the net controller on HF needs to have a station that can reach out and talk to somebody, okay? We had problems with trying to use, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, ineffective antennas, lots of interference, and not enough power. Um, net control people need to keep an organized notebook. You might find yourself in a, in a, a situation where you have to defend something you did. Uh, it really helps to have a, a whiteboard next to your radio so you can write stuff down and erase it and come back later and, and, and use it again. You need to carry everything you might possibly need and then some. You need to have a sturdy antenna system of some sort. A lot of the guys had crossband repeaters in their cars so that they could roam around. A few, they could be a few hundred or a thousand yards away from there and, and, and be doing something and helping somebody and still be able to hear the net control call them and get back to them, even though they're 10, 15 miles away. Battery power. We ran the net control system on battery powered, even though we had the lights on and the air conditioning running on a diesel genset. The diesel genset, a brand new Caterpillar unit, failed and, and probably contaminated fuel, and it was on and off and on and off and on and off, and we were not going to be out of communication. So prepare to deal with the unexpected. We uh, checked in on the 3950 uh, Florida Emergency Net every day. It seemed like we were just exactly the wrong place. We were in the middle of the skip zone to be doing HF back to Tallahassee. And we, we tried dipoles, we tried verticals, and we could not get a reliable signal. And uh, we're 350 miles away, which just seemed like it was exactly in the skip zone for, for 40 meters and for 75 meters and 20 meters. So. If you're going to take a position like this, you want to make sure that you are properly equipped radio-wise. Okay, this is what drove me to be so fascinated with Envis antenna equipment. Okay, and the ARES group is is uh, focusing on on everybody knowing what it is, how to set it up, how to use it. It's been used at field day a couple of times, winter field day. So, if you're not familiar with NVIS, come talk to me. Um, the bottom line is hams are communicators. Sometimes while we were in the EOC, we needed to get information from, from the net controller over to the, the, the ESF people over in, in the next building. Well, 
If you don't have a radio, you get to run over there with a piece of paper. We're communicators. Um, the hams need to be professional. You're going to be nose to nose with professional law enforcement and military people. They will act, expect you to be professionals. Keep that in mind. It's all about communicating. All those things that we try to practice doing when we have a, uh, a net. Key the microphone, wait, give all the links in the system a second to activate before you speak. Okay? Everybody in this room knows why we do that, and yet everybody in the room forgets occasionally. Okay? But it's critical that you always use that protocol. Speak clearly and plainly. Don't use acronyms. Enunciate your call sign or your tactical sign. Because if you don't, somebody's going, what? And so you've basically wasted time. There was no time to be wasted during, when we were running net control out there. Break your mess messages into easily copyable pieces. Use a phonetic alphabet if it's warranted. Time is precious. <clears throat> Release the microphone key after you've stopped talking. <laughs> Sometimes you forget. It gets a little exciting some days. Other lessons learned. You cannot count on complex communication systems to survive a combination of wind and water that even a small hurricane brings. Forget cell phones, trunken radio, conventional repeater radio system, pagers, landline phones, fiber optic cable, internet over telephone, internet over TV cable, satellite phones, commercial broadcast stations. All of those were dead. And I have found that to be true everywhere I've gone after a hurricane. When it comes to talking about cell phones, even before the storm gets there, any communication system that is what they call a subscriber system, where you pay to have the right to be on a system and you use it every now and then. A landline telephone, a pager system, a trunking radio system, a cell phone system. They typically have no more than enough hardware on board and functional for 10% of the people that are subscribed to the service. And so when the doo-doo hits the rotary oscillator, basically everybody jumps on the cell phone or everybody goes for their pager or whatever at the same time, and that's the end of it. It shuts down. Okay. Um, this has happened too many times, and yet the managers that are in charge of these groups forget it time after time. They will go, oh, I'll send our guys with our cell phones. Uh, three years ago, after, in Matthew, over in uh, Mariana, Florida, we had the FEMA crew of all people came out and they brought all of their computer laptops and stuff that were networked together and they were expecting to use that equipment in the middle of Mariana in the middle of a radio dead zone. And they couldn't understand why they couldn't get a signal. And, and it's just basically, it happens over and over and over again. Okay. You may someday find yourself handling public service radio duty. Volunteer to be a net controller for your local Aries net now. Learn to do it. Learn the protocols. Get used to, be, to taking and giving messages. Okay? At the end of it all, the EOC personnel and the locals were just full of praise for the ham radio people that came out to help. It was just that simple. They, they were thrilled to death. Okay, um, I want to say one more thing that I did not have any slides for. Every time I've been out after a hurricane, they have there's one common thing always happens. Everybody depends on their generator sets, whether they're diesel or gasoline, and nobody provides for fuel. Nobody provides for servicing the machines if they get dirty fuel. A diesel will run if it gets wet, but it will not run if it gets wet fuel. If it gets water in the fuel, it's done. At uh, Mariana High School, they had a 500, 500 kilowatt diesel gen set permanently installed there. By the time I had gotten there, it had been running for four days. The first thing I did was go back and stick the tank. And it had two inches of fuel on, in it. You know, a 10-foot a wide, 6-foot deep, 4-foot tall tank had two, two inches of fuel left in it. And so my first job was to stir up the doo-doo until somebody got over there because we had 600 
old people and sick people in the high school. What a nightmare that would have been if we had run out of fuel and lost lights and air conditioning. Okay, enough of that. That's that is one of my soapboxes. Yes. First, when you said uh, dispatching law enforcement and everything, since all the signs and landmarks were gone, how did you do? Black law, or did they did they have GPS available, or any kind of grid system? Well, there was GPS available, but typically, what you had was. <laughs> you, all of the tactical signs were places like Bill's Walmart and Fred's General Store because the people were set up with their communications and this, there, were, there was no Fred's General Store left. It was a parking lot. And that's where they were, but everybody knew where it was. The locals could find their way around. Okay, and, and it basically, it, it, if it had been a more sophisticated, if it had been Jacksonville, we'd have been pretty much screwed because the number of streets you know, out there in the country it wasn't so bad a lot of places i understand after andrew it was a giant disaster because all the street signs were down in the miami area in the, the south florida area second question is after this we talked about ndis now are they like Tallahassee going to have an ndis system in place there permanently or are they going to have to learn this all over again <sighs> Because just because you're on it doesn't mean they're going to connect. When Brian and I were in Mariana in 2018, I guess it was, which was like a week after I retired, they we could hear the guys talking on the the uh, SARS net because they're trying to get some HF radio stuff set up, and they got a peop bunch of people out there that well we can't put the antennas up because there's no trees out here. It's like, <laughs> it's just, it was very, very frustrating. Thank God the UHF radio system worked as well as it did. So, yes, they need to, Invis works much better when you have everybody on the same, the same type of antenna. It, it makes it a lot better. And, it, and every EOC needs to have an Invis antenna. And it's so easy to do. I set mine up at Mariana High School. I had about 10 pieces of PVC about this long, pounded in the ground, and stretched a 75-meter dipole across the thing and hooked up my, my ICOM tuner to it, and it worked great. No trees to put their doggone antennas in. I was just amazed. Okay. Any other? Yes. On the same question about the National Guard, when they deployed, did it use it? I can't speak to that. I was at school. Brian? No. Um, they're using, their National Guard brings satellite com, a mobile cell on wheels, and some VHF, public safety stuff. They're not looking for HF. They're, they're trying to give the most bang for the buck. In other words, like that, a mobile cell on wheel, how many people they can provide sellers to search for? Satellite, they normally hook up 25 computers. Again, how many people can they get on one system? That's what they're looking for. Um, the VHF stuff is just to supplement local public safety. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen them use. Well, I have the Army practices put those up. They have, they have a contest to put it put this in town. So I'm just wondering why they didn't. <laughs> no. you know, they set them up like in uh, 15 minutes operational. Right. Yeah, it says even like the Army Corps of Engineers, it's all satellite or cellular based, provide the maximum subscriber connections they can. It's like, you know, we had Operation Radar <clears throat> down in Camp Blanford. That was an exercise that was put on by the state, and they brought virtually every emergency communication device that was owned by some. A government organization or whatever, it brought it to Camp Landing and they spread these out all over the property there. And they, uh, somebody wrote a scenario for an operation and whatnot. But uh, they had uh, all these different organizations, the National Guard, the Army, uh, Air Force, uh, the, uh, uh, the name of it, uh, the people who do take care of the dead bodies. Uh, 
FEMA. It was everybody had their own radio equipment, radio systems, and not FEMA. FEMA. And I went over there. The guy uh, was complaining that he couldn't get his radio to work. Uh, in Fimor Trail. Well, when you go in a trailer, you know, here's this basically it's a, it's a table, it's a slab where they process debut. And, and it's kind of warped when you first walk in it, but I put my focus on the radio. They had a nice uh, uh, Motorola HF radio in there. And uh, and the guy just absolutely had no idea how to operate. And uh, he had it tuned up on some frequency where uh, he didn't read the dial correctly. He tried to operate it there and, and it wouldn't work. But uh, there were all kinds of systems there. They were SATCOM systems. Um, we took the uh, Red Cross Mercy Communications vehicle down there. They had all sorts of HF in it. We uh, run the mast up with a, uh, a, a TA 33 Junior on it uh, and running a uh, TS2000, right? and uh, we had a lot of people come look at that. Uh, but all sorts of business band stuff. Um, they could uh, they could program the uh, radios to interface with uh, the forestry division, whoever it was. And uh, they have these other devices. They call them AC, AC, ACU1000, and it's it's a patch system. And they can take these different radios from these different systems from the different organizations like Forestry and FEMA and whoever, and they can run it through that ACU 1000 and patch them all together. There's only one drawback to that is that uh, the ACU 1000 will not cross connect uh, encryption. So, <laughs> um, you know, if it's law enforcement you know, uh, or uh, say a rescue organization or whatever, if it's encrypted, it, it won't pass the encryption across the connections. Well, I will summarize that from my, my professional viewpoint. If we have a big hurricane here in Jacksonville, we are in trouble. Our EOC is very poorly, very, very poorly equipped. And uh, not only equipment wise, run. Um, Ross? Uh, Jay Yang helps with mutual aid disaster communities. Yep. When JEA sends over transformers and wire and stuff, do they make a notation we gave? This? Absolutely. And we do eventually get. Absolutely. Well, usually it comes out of the federal government, okay. it comes directly from the federal government. Okay. Does JEA do a good job when they send 100 transformers over? to replenish that stock soon and so that we won't uh, I can't speak to that personally but I when we've had problems in the plant that FEMA the federal government pay for they work us to death on timesheets making sure that every dime that you can charge to the feds gets charged to them I don't know about the guys that go out but I can I'll bet you that they they have timesheets they have material sheets and and they get processed and they go straight up the, the chain to the federal government. Any other? Yeah, Henry. Okay, so I've been watching the news and up in the northeastern part of the United States where all this flooding occurred, mm -hmm. I heard the uh, governor or mayor or somebody talking about the flooding. And he said, well, you know, if we didn't have above ground so electrical feed, everything was underground, we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, you just flooded and all this stuff and transformers, my, my neighborhood is underground fed. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, if I had six or seven feet of water in my neighborhood, every power transformer on my block is going to be underground. Am I wrong in thinking about this? I mean, is the electrical grid, it's not waterproof when you put it underground. It's, you have transformer vaults and you, and basically they keep them pumped out. But if the, the vaults are inundated by water because of the, the street storm drains and 
everything else is not working properly, you're going to be full of water with the expected result. So, but the, where I'm going with this in the aftermath is, say, this vault you're talking about, I've never seen it's it. It's a concrete box. Okay, so if I drain the water out and I let it dry, is the transformer hermetically sealed and it would come back to work? <laughs> well, it might not be the transformer, but the bushings, the insulators are going to be filthy. Right. Uh, you might have water intrusion into cables. You might have water intrusion into transformers. Transformers, they build pretty stout, and they seal them up pretty darn good. So, and, so and, really, you know, really what the politician, really, he didn't know what the hell he was talking no. about. <laughs> not, not a, no. Not a chance. Yes, yeah, that's just running their mouth. Drive a whole lot like our government. Easy now. Easy. It's like downtown Jacksonville. There is a, a, a massive power grid under downtown Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. And you can expect if we have another flood like we have in Dora, yeah. that that entire grid downtown is going to go down. And uh, if you don't have a generator up on the roof of your building, you're not uh, lots of the build the the uh, the businesses that have emergency power generation on their property downtown. It's in the basement of their building. Yep. You know about that, Henry? Yeah. We, we talk about a repeater. Any other questions? Uh, I got one okay. So yep. I just came back from a vacation at uh, Biloxi. I went to the Palace Casino which thoroughly enjoyed, I enjoyed myself. However, um, when we were going down the main drag there, it was very uh, sorrowful to see driveway after driveway after driveway that went to nowhere. In other words, what I'm saying is I was on the bay out there in Biloxi, and all those houses were just gone, yep. and they didn't come back. And so what you see is a screen with a driveway, and it's empty. They never built back. Right. Eventually, some may be able to come build one. Well, I will say this: there were houses that were built, what I call up on stilts. The Palace Hotel, where I stayed at, uh, I did see a news report where the first floor was flooded. So their answer to this is they moved all the casino machines to the second floor. So that way, all that they lost was where you would side into the hotel and that that's recoverable <laughs> all of the gambling machines were up were up higher just good business <laughs> and i also want to comment well, i did go to one uh one casino that was on a barge that way if, if it does flood the barge would just float up uh, the barge was on 1998 yeah there's so many armed guards around it you were going to die if you got those. Well, oh, they have to be uh, over the water over there. Yeah, well, the barge that I went, went on went to, I mean, it was on on water. So now, you know, I don't know when you talk about 100 mile an hour wind, I don't know if it's going to survive that, but I guess they're thinking it was. Depends on how big the barge is, I guess. Most, most things like that, they would sink them and let them sit in the yeah. mud, I would think. Well, I went to a restaurant that was right on the bay, and I was telling my brother, I said, this is ridiculous. It was it was up. You had to go up like, I don't know, 20 feet to get to the restaurant. I took an elevator. But there were no windows in the restaurant at all. On the bay. Yeah, no, no windows at all. And I guess the idea is if a hurricane comes, it's all open, so it all blows through. And everything in the restaurant was like just – Rough wood, like sitting on benches and stuff like yeah. that. And I guess it was, well, it's a restaurant now. It'll be sticks when a hurricane comes through. I was thinking that Keystone, Bluxley, 69. And the thing about the golf is he walked out five miles to not go over your chest. That's how shallow it is. Yeah. yeah. When you have a tidal surge, it's all beach. Right? Yep. So, even flying the case when I actually see the sharks and spots. Had a question over here? Yeah. Yes, sir. I was just wondering 
during your presentation, you said that the satellite phones were also uh, not uh, why okay. Was that? okay. A satellite phone, okay. A satellite phone is a subscriber system, okay? You buy the hardware, and they got a certain number of satellites and a certain number of frequencies available for use. And because of the cost, very few people use it on a routine basis, okay? Except when we get a hurricane. And then all of the managers at JEA and FPNL and every bank and, and the rich people, they get their cell phones out and it's like, we're ready for this. And then as soon as something happens, it's like, bloop, you saturate the hardware. The radio still works great. Satellite works great, but there's it, it's 10 pounds and a 10 pounds and a five pound bag. It quits. Okay. Cell phones do the same thing. Um, back when we had push to talk cell phones, hit the microphone button, key it, key it, bonk, key it, bonk, key it, bonk. Busy, busy, busy. Key it. Did it. You got through. Okay. That's on a normal day. Our uh, city of Jacksonville's trunk and radio system has the same problem. Basically, you get too many people using it at the same time, and it, nothing works. Okay? They have a priority scheme. Yes, they did. And JEA's priority number four. Okay. I'm sorry, I hear a voice. You have a question online. Oh. A question. <laughs> so what's the question, Brandy? Okay, hang on a second. I'm trying to, I have no idea how to work this. Rajesh, come make the magic stuff work. I'm losing my battery, guys. So I'm going to say goodnight. KB4B, signing clear. All right, see you later, Jack. Okay. I got a battery for you, Jack. Okay. Bye. Who had their who had a question online? Good good job, Todd. Thanks, Jack. Any questions online? Go away once. Chat. I can't see. Thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, talk about that NVIS antenna. That was and your presentation was super impressive. Oh, thank, thank you, you Mike. Any other questions? No. Sorry. Okay. Um, yes, as usual, I've talked too long. Um, Talk to Sam for me. Talk to me. Uh, any, other, any other questions on the subject? Okay. Thanks for putting up with me. Um, as you can tell, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. After you go out and you risk your equipment and your automobile and sometimes your own neck and, and you see these things happen over and over again, it kind of, it kind of uh, becomes annoying. And I spent a good part of my career at JEA hounding management trying to get them to do a few things that would put them in less peril if we ever had a storm. And this rig presentation that I gave tonight was from 2005. I made a presentation to management and I was able to get about $40,000, $45,000 worth of funding and we bought ham radio gear and put, we bought, made kits to put in 21 vehicles and 19 uh, base stations and radio and antennas and coaxes and stuff. And we did that in 2005 or 2006. And I was still trying to get them installed in 2018 when I retired. Okay. Same thing goes any big business. The it's, it's difficult to get these kind of things done because they're high risk, but low likelihood events. Okay. So my suggestion to you as fellow ham operators is to have your own gear, know how to use it, practice using it, that means you check in on the net, the nets, and participate in the net control activities. It's very important. And when the doo doo does hit the rotary oscillator here in Jacksonville, because one of these days it's going to happen again. I went through Dora as a five year old. 
It'll happen again one of these days, and the rest of them are not prepared. They just aren't. It's just that simple. They are not prepared for it. So it might save your bacon or your family's bacon, or maybe you'll be able to help somebody in the community. Any other questions? Signing off. All right, Roger, your turn. Thank you. Uh, before we go, <laughs> our computer guy. Uh, you can you can talk. To okay. Um, before we go, uh, nominating committee. We need to put two people together to besides myself for nominee officers coming up for next year. So, do we have anybody out here who'd like to be on the nominating committee? All right, Todd. Henry? I'm all for the <laughs> All right, so there's three of us. And then it will come to me there for any uh, nominations. Uh, again, the nomination will be in November for officers for the club, the secretary, president, secretary, vice president, and treasurer. Two hardest job is the uh, treasurer and the secretary. It's easy for me, the president. All I do is talk to y'all and let, it, let everybody else do it. So it's pretty easy. Y'all come here so one of y'all could run this prison. I mean, it's just that easy to do. So um, I got nothing else. Um, there's bread over here in the hallway. There's a light on in there. Please grab yourself some or it's going to get thrown away. We thank you very much for coming tonight. We'll see you next month.